Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a family portrait and it has been a long time since I've done a family portrait. Today it's going to be a ranked family portrait on the house of Tower Perfume. So Andy Tower's house, who I must admit um, has gotten some play on my channel. But the reason that uh, I have not done a family portrait on this house yet is I have tended to focus on the houses that I have more bottles of. So for example, I've got family portraits on Amouage and Chanel and Rojas and and um, Frederick Malls and YSL and Dior and Creed and Guerlain and stuff like that, right? Those were the first ones to get the family portraits. And I actually have an entire playlist if you like the idea of just showing off a lot of perfumes from one particular house and talking about them, you can go check out my family portrait playlist. Um, but today we're going to talk about the House of Tower Perfumes. And this one has not gotten a its own family portrait because I only have six bottles from this house, but I have reviewed two off of samples, and I'm going to include the two off of samples that I have reviewed, bring this to a top eight, okay, in the countdown. And Andy Tower is a very interesting fellow. Um, he's got an amazing blog that you can go check out. It goes all the way back to 2005, basically, and it sort of chronicles his journey, just like this YouTube channel chronicles my journey in the fragrance world and what I like and reviewing things and what I'm sniffing and what I'm trying and stuff like that. His blog kind of does that as well, but from his perspective and where he came from. And I must say, we, we call a lot of houses nowadays niche, which are not truly niche, in my opinion. For example, Parfums de Marly and Initio are considered niche. Um, you know, uh, Amouage is considered niche. And um, now those houses, and I would include Amouage in that, they have big boards of directors. They have committees making decisions. You know, they have trial and error, they bring them to, you know, um, do sniffing and, and market testing and all of that stuff. And I really feel like the true niche houses are the houses like Andy Tower. They're the houses like uh, Liz Moore's of Papillon. They're the John Beebles of January Scent Project. They're those type of houses, you know, the ones that are not necessarily just a one-man operation, but they don't have shareholders to let's say everyone has a shareholder that they have to respond to, even if it's just him and his wife and they're running the business, but they don't have big multinational corporations breathing down their neck like what's with, with like, for example, what is happening at Guerlain with LVMH. Um, obviously, it's terrible what's happened to Guerlain. Previously, my favorite house of all time, but over the last 20 years, the steady decline is just almost, ter it feels like a terminal decline is really what what it feels like. Um, I know Thierry Vasso takes care of their historical fragrances, but God, I would just love to see one day the, um, the, the, the bean counters at LVMH just take the shackles off of Thierry Vasso at Guerlain and just let them create again, you know? But I know that they're all, all about money, and that's what makes these niche houses like Andy Tower so interesting, in, in my personal opinion. So it's going to be a top eight today, but first... I want to talk about my scent of the day because these type of houses, these these true niche houses where, you know, I mentioned Liz Moore's of Papillon, Andy Tower from Tower Perfumes, you know, they almost feel like they're bumping right up against my favorite type of house lately, which has been the artisanal houses, as I'm calling them. The Aris La Dore's, the Ensars, the Bortnikoff's. Yesterday I reviewed Ambrosia by Sherwood Parfums. I am not... I was not expecting the response from, there are so many people who reached out and, and were just willing to blind buy a very limited edition bottle. There was 50 bottles for the whole world. Many people reached out, took the leap of faith because I said I loved it. Uh, and I hope you love it as well. Sometimes uh, art, artisanal fragrances can be a sort of acquired taste is, is where I'm going with this. And this is a great example. And I actually have a video of this particular fragrance on my channel. If you would like to check it out, it's called EO two from Ensar. And this is the Pure Parfum, okay? And when I, I have a review on this, so you can go check out my review and my thoughts. But when I reviewed it, I did not like it too much because I was given a sample, obviously, by, by a friend. I believe Eddie sent me this sample. Thank you, Eddie. Very, very kind of you, my friend. Um, or I bought maybe a couple samples in a bundle and he kind of threw this in. But um, uh, I struggled with this at first. And, and some people say this shares nothing with other Ensars. I completely disagree. I got similarities to EO1, and I know EO1 and EO2 are separate fragrances. EO1 is like um, sort of the 
um, Sultan Leather Atar version in a sprayable format. There's a lot of leathers and castoriums and ouds and stuff like that. Um, and this is focused more on the musk. This has real Siberian deer musk pods in here. And if you've never smelled real musk, it is a holy experience. It's a religious experience. And yet, as beautiful as the musk was in here, there's a lot more going on. And what I really detected when I first wore it, the first couple times I tried it, is it gave me hints of a, um, a Rige La Dore fragrance, which I also reviewed on the channel. And I also said, you know, it's okay, but it's not really my thing. It was very challenging at the time called Oud Picante. Now, fast forward months, months later, maybe even a year later since those reviews, um, I would die to have a bottle of EO number two and Oud Picante. Those two are very high on my list. And it's just the nose changes is the reality of the situation. It's the best way I can describe it. As time goes on, your nose literally changes. Um, what you smell a year ago is not what you smell today. You're constantly evolving, just like you're constantly growing and hopefully mentally growing as well, not just physically, uh, or for some of us guys, not just the belly growing, but um, you know, you're also mentally and spiritually and emotionally growing every single day that you live on earth, right? And so the nose also changes as one of your five main senses. And I will just tell you that with artisanal houses, sometimes they need time because there's just so much going on. I mean, in EO number two, for example, there is a Basmati rice accord, which I absolutely get. Um, the rice accord itself, but also almost like just the texture. Imagine just a million grains of rice and you can just kind of run, run your hand along all of the texture of each little grain. And coriander, cumin, it's definitely, it has an animalic side. There's French cedar, pink pepper, and rosewood, okay? And I love rosewood. Rosewood's one of my favorite notes. Um, one of my favorite woody notes. In the heart, there's black tea, clove, Himalayan rose, jasmine sambac, papau sandalwood, which is a very rare sandalwood. Um, it's supposed to give it, I think, a slightly fruity aspect, but I, I want to say it's a, um, it's a sandalwood you're not going to smell in many sort of um, just, at, I don't want to say average, but let's say designer fragrances. And Turkish Rose, and then the heart, the base, is real Siberian deer musk, Australian sandalwood, civet, labdanum, real Mysore sandalwood, papau oud, and Timor sandalwood. Timor sandalwood is another rare sandalwood. Um, and so all of this just kind of hits you, and that opening is very, very spicy. I got a lot of sort of the harsh... It's very, um, almost like you could consider them like wild spices, you know, they are, um, uh, just kind of thrown at you, almost like spice thrown in your eyes, you know, and they're challenging. Um, the, the, the spiciness reminded me a lot of Oud Picante, and since this came out a year after Oud Picante, I really figured that it borrowed a lot from what Russian Adam created with Oud Picante, and I still think there is some borrowing, but... This has the Ensar Sparkle, and I talked a little bit about it yesterday when I reviewed Ambrosia. When you use high amounts of real ambergris in your creations, there is just this sparkle about it. And, you know, there's a debate going on right now between, I think, these sort of polar opposite views. On one view, you have these houses like Ensar, and this is the stuff I've been really wanting to wear lately. Um... And on this side, they just want to use the absolute highest quality materials, throw a dollop of, of real oud, real sandalwood, real musk, and bam, here you go, right? On the other side, you have these very uh, well-trained perfumers who go to school for years, learn how to be actual perfumers, and maybe they're not using real musk, but damn it, they can create an accord that smells like a real musk accord, right? And there's an art to it, you know, it, there's a, it, there, it's not just a science of put this much oud, this much musk, this much sandalwood, and here you go. It obviously is a science, but there's also an art to creating it, especially when you don't have, you know, the, avail the availability to use, let's say, as much oak moss. They can only use 0.1% oak moss now, according to uh, IFRA regulations. And, um, you know, real oud is so expensive that they have to create an accord. So there's the other side where we're smelling these amazing creations sometimes by perfumers who have to have to sort of work as magicians, you know? Um, and so for me, as I've come around to these artisanal fragrances, I will tell you that sometimes they just take some extra time because they're so, 
real ingredients are so uh, different from what you're used to smelling, even if you've gone to the niche houses. And I think most people compare, let's say, an Andy Tower to an Atat Deeb de Orange, you know, that kind of a niche house. Or I mentioned Amouage or, um, you know, these, these sort of niche houses that are off the beaten path, but still they're, they're niche. You'll find them at a Harrods, for example, or you'll find them at like a Nordstrom's here in the United States. You won't find an Insar at a Nordstrom's or, or an Ariz Lodore, right? It's, it's a different type of perfumery, but these type of perfumers, for example, Andy Tower, who we're going to talk about today here in just a second, um, they are bumping up against these artisanal houses to me, but they're doing it in a niche style, if that makes sense. So my hat really comes off to Andy Tower, but this was my scent of the day, EO2, and you can see this is all I have left, and I'm just like, oh man, I am loving, loving these artisanal houses lately. You know, the um, deeper and deeper I get into my journey, someone wrote a review on this, and and it was it was a pretty funny review on Parfumo, the whole thing was comparing this to um, some movie, I forgot, Silent Hill or something. But on the last line, he said maybe one of the most poignant lines that I could describe when you get into artisanal fragrances. He said, after this, for some reason, all of a sudden, half of my collection doesn't make sense anymore. And I was like, wow, that is a powerful, powerful statement. Because I know what he means. It's hard to go back and wear stuff um, once you get to, to wearing these type of fragrances. Like this has a lot of this real Siberian deer musk in there. And real Siberian deer musk has this um, sort of ability to recreate not just the deer, but also like the area around the deer. Like you're smelling the grass that it's standing on. You're smelling the tree that it rubs up against. You're smelling the fur on the deer's body. You know, you're, you're smelling the mountain range in the background. You're smelling all of these different elements. And of course, since it's an animalic product, it adds this pissiness, um, this urinous, uh, musky warmth. You know, it's very warm, but very almost like a, it's a religious experience smelling real musk. And it's in here in the Pure Parfum. And, but this has this Insar sparkle, right? So anyways, that's, that was my scent of the day. I just wanted to lament this story about, um, you know, these artisanal houses. This was one that I actually did not give a very favorable review to. And now I've come around to it to the point where I would love to have a bottle of this in the collection. But alas, you cannot own everything. So, okay, so let's focus on our good friend, Andy Tower. So this is going to be a top eight. And I'll read you just a little blurb from Parfumo about him. Tower stuff. Swiss perfumer Andy Tower himself has adopted this term to describe the typical tower note that pervades all of his fragrances in a medium or background way. And in interviews, he reports grinning broadly about this melancholy looking birch tar tower stuff. Originally a chemist with a doctorate, then an IT project manager and self-taught part-time perfumer, he is now fully focused on his hobby turned profession with his company Tower Perfumes, creating his fragrances at home in Zurich's Honk neighborhood. I probably butchered that, sorry. Um, Andy Tower developed his first commercial, but far from commercial-oriented fragrance, number one, Le Maroc Pour Elle, which I reviewed on the channel, in 2004 when a bookseller friend asked him to design an exclusive perfume for his store. The first milestone of a success story emerged from this private passion. In 2006, perfume critic Luca Turin wrote of number two, Le Air du Desert Marocain, in the NZZ Folio. It is probably the best perfume from the hands of an amateur since Coty gave up his bread and butter job at Antoine C at Chris at Campagne and composed La Rose Jacques Minot in 1904. This praise and a five-star award made the perhaps most niche of niche creations at the time abruptly famous in the professional world. Incidentally, Turin wrote number two, La Air du Desert Marocain, to his wedding to Tina Sanchez. That is a... Uh, honor, I would say, uh, for the perfume critic who writes about perfume to actually pick your fragrance to wear to a wedding, to his wedding, uh, that says more than anything he could write. So, bravo. While at the beginning of Tower Perfumes, he still bottled his perfumes himself and sent them with personal let letters, Andy Tower has been fulfilling his need for closeness and exchange with his clientele and fragrance lovers since 2005 by running his own blog, with great commitment, and he is committed to that blog. If you go to Tower Perfumes 
and just click on the blog at the top, you'll see he's got stuff coming, going forever. So one thing I should mention is, like I said, this top eight is going to include two samples that were sent to me very kindly by um, Tim, I believe. Tim sent me these tower samples, so thank you, Tim. But there are more that will be discussed on the channel soon that we have not got to. So for example, we have two from um, the Towerville, I believe, Towerville series, Rose Flash and Vanilla Flash. We also have Cologne du Magarab, uh Taylo Blue, which I think is Andy Towers' version of a blue slash aquatic fragrance. Um, Un Rose de Kandahar, which I'm very excited to, to review that, and a fragrance called Orange Star, which I think is number 10, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay. So those are still to come, and they're not on the list because they have not been reviewed yet. But this is kind of what his sample set looks like. And if you've never seen a tower box, this is what his box, his packaging looks like. Immersive sculptures. And you can see he actually wrote this as La Oud, which, is, which climbed the ranks very fast. Um, and they basically sit like this, and it's got that same sort of slide mechanism as the... Um, as the sample set. So I like the um, consistency in packaging. And uh, I'm a big fan of his fragrances, a huge fan of Andy Tower. And you know what's funny is when uh, Parfumo was talking about that um, tower stuff, if you will. So of course in Guerlain, they call it the Guerlainade. I think it would be much easier to call it Tower Odd, although he wants to differentiate himself and say tower stuff. And I think my personal opinion is that what he has created that is so special is an ambergris accord. That's what I think. I don't think Andy Tower uses real ambergris. I don't think he ever claimed to use real ambergris. I don't think if he used real ambergris, his fragrances could be priced how they currently are. But I think he created maybe one of the best synthetic ambergris accords I've ever smelled. And he uses it in everything. I mean, almost everything I've smelled from him has it. Or has it in some fashion whether a little bit or a lot. Um, excuse me. Actually, I've been coming up, um, coming off of this cold, so I'm going to put a cough drop in before I start coughing in, in you guys' ear. So, excuse me. A little throwback to Andy Towers' home country. Ricola! I think these are Swiss. Um, okay. So, let's start. Number eight on the list. So number eight is actually, and it's not fair because something has to be eight and something has to be one, but I can tell you there is nothing on this list that uh, is a bad fragrance. Every single one of these is good. And like I said, every single, well, the, the samples we're going to discuss are reviewed, um, but many of these still need to be reviewed. Like I said, this house, while it hasn't been ignored, you will be hearing more about the House of Andy Tower on the channel. But this is my most recent Andy Tower review, and it comes in at number eight. And I hate putting it here because I love this. I actually think it's full bottle worthy. <laughs> I would love a bottle of this. Some people compare it to Reflection Man. I can see the similarity. When I sprayed it, I could see the similarity, but they go in different directions, okay? And um, this is called La Air de Alpes Suisses, or The Air Over the Swiss Alps. Okay, <clears throat> sorry to have to do that in your ear, but um, like I said, getting over this cold. So this is Alpine Herbs, Air Accord, and Granite with powdery notes, green notes, Alpine Lily, and spicy notes with a base of Larch, Beech, which are two very rare woods. You don't see those used very often, and a Soil Accord. So the realism of many of Tower's fragrances are striking. Uh, it's, it's, it's a testament to his, I think, perfuming ability to create something like this. So as a frag head, this is what I, and you can go check out my full review if you want a deeper in-depth talk on each one, on, on the ones I have videos on. But this one in particular, I said that when I saw it, I was almost disappointed by the note listing before even giving it a chance because I'm like, air accord, you know, who wants a fresh fragrance? Frag heads want heavy, right? We want challenging, we want animalics, we want um, we want everything to be more. And, and that's like that Russian Adam disease, that illness that I've talked about before. We want more musk, more oud, more ambergris, more all of these, you know, heavy notes. Um, and this fragrance proves that you don't have to have everything heavy. 
if it's just executed properly. The execution here is flawless. And that's why I hate putting this at number number eight, but I have to because there's big hitters coming up and they come fast and heavy. Um, so I would say if you're in the market for a spring scent or summer scent that is unique and different, and and yes, there are all these different types, you know, um, touches in here. I remember that Alpine herb note being quite prominent in the beginning, and then I remember really op it opening up to the air accord. Uh, the name is perfect, the air over the Swiss Alps. And I think this gets overlooked behind many of his other big hitters. It's getting overlooked even in this eight countdown that I'm doing here. But I'm telling you, give this a shot if you're if you're um, if you're open-minded to a fresh fragrance that smells different from your usual fresh fragrances. Uh, the air over the Swiss Alps, I think, is an amazing creation and full bottle worthy. Um, okay, next on the list, number seven. Number seven, we have a fragrance that I acquired based on the tried and true method of how you should acquire fragrances. And I'm very lucky because a lot of people send me samples. And that's one of the biggest advantages of having a channel, I would say. Um, and it's also one of the biggest downside because you can see all of these samples up here waiting to be discussed. There's also an entire cabinet of samples over here you can't see waiting to be discussed. And there's only so much time, right? And you can't talk about everything. You have to, and you have to give things the time they deserve, right? So uh, there's this tug of war when you have a channel. Um, because even if you discovered one or two things a day, every single day, if you discovered something new every day, you'd never catch up. The amount of releases, it's impossible. Uh, Rich Mitch and I were talking about this very recently, where we were saying, you have to wear what you love. Because... If you go on this exploration constantly, there's always, always something else to explore, right? So you have to find times for your true loves. For me, Bellamy, right? For him, uh, Balenciaga Poro, or whatever it is. You have to find, you have to work those true loves in, or or you'll just constantly, your favorites won't get worn. You'll constantly be wearing new things. So this came from sort of um, this exploration. Someone sent me a sample. And if you go watch my video, I was a little lukewarm on it, um, but this won me over by sampling. The more I tried it, the more I loved it. And I ended up getting a bottle at a very, very fair price is the other reason why. Um, but mostly because I love the fragrance and, and the bottle fell in my lap at a very fair price. This is Sundowner. Sundowner came out in 2021. La Air de Alpes Suisses came out in 2019, by the way. So we got 19 and now 2021. And this is what every, I think, sweet tobacco fragrance that's released in recent times wishes it was, right? So if you like things like Herod by Parfum de Marly, you know, these very sweet sort of tobaccos, if you like Guerlain's new tobacco honey, but you want a fragrance that develops and doesn't just sit there, it's not bland, it's not boring, um, you know, it, it actually does things, it changes, and the note listing um, is Cipriol. So it almost, sometimes you almost think maybe there's a hint of oud in here. There's no oud. It's Cipriol. <laughs> Cipriol, tobacco absolute, cinnamon, orange zest, patchouli, sandalwood, vanilla, ambergris. Okay. And that, and, and in here, you really can sense that uh, ambergris accord I was mentioning earlier that he created. Beautiful. Bergamot, cacao absolute. Um which adds a little bit of chocolatiness to the to the sweet tobacco. Rose, Absolute, and Tonka Bean. So the Tonka Bean adds a little bit of that gloopy uh, sweetness, but it's not disgustingly sweet. That's the thing about Andy Towers fragrances. There are some fragrance companies, like when you open their sample set, all you smell is disgusting amber woods and way too much of them, right? His fragrances are never like that. I've never experienced one like that, ever. His fragrances are always well-dosed, expertly blended, properly done, good materials. Um, you never just get hit in the face with a big uh, uh, sludge of, of amber woods, even though he may be using them in very small moderation. I've never gotten that vibe with him. So this is a example of a sweet fragrance. Many people think I hate all sweet fragrances. That's not true. This is an example of a sweet tobacco fragrance that I actually like. Sometimes I even enjoy wearing Herod. I have a bottle of Herod. Um, in the cold, sometimes you just crave that kind of sweet 
um, vanillic tobacco thing, but this just does it better than many of those in my opinion. Uh, that's why I decided to add this to the collection and tobacco is one of my all-time favorite notes. I love tobacco in, in all of its forms, but this is probably, you know, if you said, Ramsey, I've got 150 bucks or whatever this is worth. I don't know what these sell for now. Um, let's see. Let's see, just out of curiosity. Um, Sundowner, 146 CHF, whatever that converts to in dollars. So let's say $150. Um, $150. And what's great um, about, if you take a look at the packaging here, to me, this is a perfect, almost like a perfect representation of the, of the fragrance. He has a knack for really um, representing his fragrances. Whenever La Air de Alp Suisses has that mountaintop on the top of his bottle, perfect representation of, of the fragrance. And same here, you know, this sort of autumnal, think of scarecrows in a golden field of wheat. Um, think of tobacco and hay, you know, think of uh, rides on sort of a, the back of like a tractor going to maybe a haunted house, right? Think of those times. It's, it's just turned sweater weather. It was hot, at least in Texas. It goes from very hot to cold and back to hot very quickly. Um, but when it goes cold, you know, just the first couple nights of sweater weather, that is what this is. The sun is setting. Um, Sundowner is a perfect name for this. It really feels like Andy Tower getting back on track. If he ever did go off track, I don't know if he ever went off track. Some people say he did. I don't know if he ever went off track, but I think this is a good return to form for him. Um, he calls this a darkness of the night with a boozy cocktail and a good dose of velvety, smoky happiness with the last sun on your cheeks. Beautiful, beautiful tobacco. Uh, perfect for this time of year too. It's January here. So brilliant. Um, that was number seven. Number six, Number six is um, another sample, and um, this one is, again, full bottle worthy, absolutely amazing. I really enjoyed it, and this is another one where I've sprayed it on, um, I, I can't forget, I can't remember how many times I've tried this, probably three or four now, and um, every time I try it, I'm like, wow, this is full bottle worthy. This is uh, Incense Rose, or actually someone corrected me. They said, actually, Ramsey, it's not Incense Rose, it's Incense Rosé. And so if you think about like Rosé Champagne, um, there is this sort of bubbly sparkliness to it. And the Clementine in the top is, from memory, much stronger than what you would expect it to be. That Clementine note really jumps out to you and, and stays and sticks. It's tenacious too. You would think it would be gone, um, but it, but it doesn't, it, it really does last and, um, incense rosé. Let me see what Andy Towers website has to say about it. Um, he says vibrant, rich, mysterious incense rosé is an elegant oriental fragrance. Imagine a flying oriental carpet with a floating rose petals passing through smoking frankincense, sprinkled rose and citrus notes, and landing on a dark balsamic resin. So one thing I remember about this is that smoky resin, resinous quality of it. The frankincense in here, the incense is absolutely beautiful. Um, I, I don't remember it being just an out and out bright, just normal rose. I think the rose kind of played, I don't want to say a background player, but it was never the main star of the show. Um, and when you think about it as incense rosé, right, it makes more sense. And um, a beautiful fragrance. Definitely full bottle worthy. Again, if money was no issue, I, I would own all of these. But um, it's cardamom, wild rose, clementine. Again, that clementine note sticks around much longer than you would think. You can go check out my review if you want more info on this one. Bergamot, frankincense, castorium, orris root, myrrh, Texas cedar, vetiver, and patchouli. So... Spicy, floral, resinous, um, woody, and that wild rose note, when it does hit, it just hits perfectly. You know, I remember it, I, I remember the rose note coming on stronger two or three hours in, uh, even though it's a top note. And I like that there's that animalic castorium, just enough to uh, give you a little bit of that animalic touch. I love that. So, uh, incense, rose, 
at um, number six. Number five. Um, number five is my vintage bottle, the only vintage bottle of Tower that I own. This is what his original bottles looked like in 2005, the stock bottle. And um, you can tell this is Incense Extreme. I love this fragrance. It's, it's really hard for me to put this at number five. And the reason is, is that this is one of my favorite incense fragrances ever, of all time. Like if you, if you go check out my This Is Not A Top 10 frankincense or, or incense video, this was in the top 10, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is basically one of those incense fragrances that does what incense fragrances are not supposed to do because incense fragrances have this, they, they almost have, um, you know, like a curse over their head, right? And the reason is, is that if you want a very natural smelling incense, historically, that natural smelling incense doesn't last very long. If you want the incense fragrance to perform, it usually is going to be filled with things like reeking amber wood, like we talked about earlier, and it's going to smell to a seasoned nose, let's say. That amber woody smell to, to give it more push is going to make it smell lower class. It's going to make it smell not as elegant, not as natural, not as fresh, right? Somehow, and, and my guess is, is that it has to do with his ambergris accord that he created, um... But somehow, Andy Tower balanced the best of both worlds. On the one hand, you get this unbelievably realistic incense. The coriander adds this green herbal quality to it, but the, but the incense is almost blended perfectly with this brilliant iris note. And the iris note makes it seem sort of um, elegant. So there's an elegance to it. It's not just a cold, harsh church incense. It's not. Um, there is more to this, although, um, of all of the Andy Tower fragrances that I have smelled, this is probably the one that is the closest to, you know, sort of representing that one particular note. And that note is incense. And of course it's beautifully blended here. Um, but incense is the focal point and it does have a little bit of that cold church incense. You know, if you like things like, um, Avignon by Comme des Garçons, which is, that's another house you could compare Andy Tower, you know, competing with those type of niche houses. Um, if you like those type of cold, churchy incense uh, fragrances, this is one of the, this is one of the kings of those type of fragrances. I love, absolutely am in love with this. Um, it is truly extreme. It lasts 10 hours on my skin, um, but it has that singular incense focus sometimes. Even though, like I said, you get a little bit of the iris, you definitely get, I can get it from the, from the, from the cap without even spraying it. You definitely get that ambergris note that I told you about earlier, that accord that he created. And if you've smelled some of his other creations, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. When you smell some of his fragrances that, uh, what did he call it? The, um, he called it tower stuff, that tower stuff is that ambergris creation, in my opinion, and you get it in spades and incense extreme. So imagine slightly green herbal coriander, petit gras mixed with a beautiful cold churchy frankincense. Um, and if you look here, it almost looks like fire, right? Um, the incense sort of rising gives off this red fire. I, I don't remember there being a lot of warmth to this outside of the spiciness, because I think the incense smells quite cold. The ambergris also gives a little bit of that oceanic coolness. The iris is maybe the only thing adding a little bit of, um, I would say, roundness. Because iris can also come across as very cool. But I love this stuff. I mean, if you're an incense lover, I would highly recommend you try Andy Tower's Incense Extreme. It's, it is it is amazing. And I love having the, the vintage bottle. It's like a little collector's piece. Um, okay, top four. Number four uh, is the... Fragrance that I think many people love, well, I take that back. Um, I think many Tower fans put this close to the top because they say it's like a richer extra version of their favorite fragrance. This is Accord du Désert at number four. And so Accord du Désert is a flanker of his famous uh, Le du Désert Marocain. And basically what he did is he took the composition that is issued as an eau de toilette intense, as he calls it, and he reissued it as an x-ray. 
an extra de parfum, okay? So it's true that this is heavier and thicker, and I can definitely feel things like the patchouli being amped up. Um, definitely the heavier notes like the patchouli and some of the heavier woods and, and balsamic notes and, and ambers are, the resinous notes are amped up. There's absolutely no doubt about it. In the base, you'll notice there's an ambergris note, which is extremely important to this fragrance. Maybe maybe this fragrance and Le Du Desert Marocain, that ambergris note is the most important, I think, to all of his creations. Um, but just imagine Le Du Desert Marocain in an enhanced x-ray form, which I like. And you would think if you know my personality that I would actually like this more. And maybe... Uh, structurally, in the way that it's built, in the way it wears, I do like it more. But Le Du Desert Marocain has something very special, which um, I feel like while this um, wears thicker and heavier and lasts longer, it just takes away from it a little bit because you need that airiness. And we'll talk about that when we get to Le Du Desert Marocain. But Accord du Desert, an amazing fragrance. I don't want to take anything away from it at number four. Probably one of the best flankers. Um, out there, along with um, along with something like Bellamy Vetiver, which is the best flanker, I think, of all time. But Accord du Desert is a very strong contender for one of the best flankers uh, put out. Number three is a fragrance that I... Um, how can I describe this? I um, was gifted this by a friend. This was gifted to me by Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Very, very kind of you. And um, I love this so much, I asked him you think it would be bad taste if I wore this to a client meeting? And he was like, dude, just go easy on the trigger, okay? And I did, I wore it. Um, and I love this stuff. I, I mean, I was not expecting to love it as much as I did. Let's put it that way. Because I talk so highly about all these artisanal houses. So I talk about the Ensars and the Aris Ladores and the Bortnikovs just like, you know, stealing my... Um, my gusto for oud you know i'm like man this is where it's really at and then i smell something like this from andy tower and i was like wow i mean blown away maybe backup bottle worthy it's so good this is called la oud and you guys know i've been on a big oud kick lately i think i'm understanding more and more of when russian adam says that oud is the top material i understand exactly why he says that and I'm beginning to feel the exact same way as him on that. I really do think it's at the top of the material pyramid, if you will. Um, it's such a special, especially when it's used properly. And in La Oud, it is used properly. Now, a couple things. Number one, there is a huge dose of castorium in this. Huge. Uh, so, if you don't like animalic fragrances, you might smell this and be like, whoa, I mean, who would want to wear that or smell like that? For me, as somebody who loves animalics when they're used like this, that castorium note makes the fragrance because this is a bold opening. This is, this is you know, not just, not just walking through the door, kicking the door down and walking through, right? There's that feeling to it. There is, you're just going to kick that door down and walk right through. And uh, it's mixed with Laotian oud, and the oud is very prominent. You get a lot of oud. And you get a lot of castorium in this in the beginning. But, of course, there's Cipriol to make more of that oud accord. There's also Styrax, this waxy Styrax note with um, a little bit of tobacco to add a little bit of smokiness to it. Um, the tobacco here, um, the tobacco, uh, I would say, is more like a secondary note. It's It's... You know, maybe you smoked a cigar a couple days ago and it's lingering on your on your fingers still or something like that, right? It's a very secondary note. The notes that stand out a little bit more are this resinous undertone, which comes from myrrh. Myrrh adds this fungal resinous undertone and patchouli. And of course, that patchouli, patchoula, whatever you want to call it, there is um, definitely this heft to this fragrance. This fragrance is a animalic, spicy, smoky, woody, sort of uh, resinous, just bomb, right? It lasts forever. I love the scent. Um, and of course, there's that patented ambergris note in here, although it's not as prominent or important, I think, as in um, the next fragrance we're going to discuss, but it is in here, along with vetiver, okay? And so this is a very masculine, very masculine take on oud, extremely masculine. Um, 
and I love it. I mean, I, I was really blown away by how I love how much I love it. I will tell you there is a new bottle. If you go to Parfumo and type it in, the, the um, bottle you'll see right front and center is the newest one, and then the one you have to click on with the writing like mine is the older bottle. Um, I don't think you have to worry about reformulations with the House of Annie Tower, with Tower Perfumes. Uh, I think I've never heard anyone complain about reformulations with Tower's fragrances ever, ever. Um, at least not, not in any circle I've ever heard people talking perfume. Have I heard them complain about reformulation? So, but just, there is a new bottle and it's a sticker on the front of it instead of him actually writing the name, which I actually really like this. You know, there's a little bit of like a personalized touch to this. I'm sure that took a lot of time, but <clears throat> to, to do each bottle. But anyways, that was number three. Number two, number two actually is number two and it is Le Air du Desert Moroccan, the air over the Moroccan desert. So this is this fragrance has been talked about on YouTube since 2005, since Luca Turin's review ad nauseum, right? And um, I do think that this is one of the best uh, niche fragrances, one of the best, you know, this, uh, this type of perfume is what niche perfumery should be, in my opinion. And I think a lot of niche perfumes have lost the soul of what this was since this came out. I'm not saying make this, but I'm saying niche perfumers need to get back to having the soul to create something like this, the air over the Moroccan desert. And the reason that I emphasize the air over the Moroccan desert is that, yes, this is a spicy amber. Yes, it is. And actually, this is one of the few fragrances that me and AC from the channel Smells Good disagree on because AC and I usually have very similar tastes in, in many regards. Uh, and he's probably one of my favorite reviewers, but he absolutely bashed this fragrance, said it was uh, said it was rubbish, he doesn't understand it, you know. Um, and I disagree with him wholeheartedly on his Le du Desert Marocain uh, uh, review, although everyone has their own opinion. This is an opinion thing that we do, right? No one's right and no one's wrong. Uh, but for me, the, what makes this a special fragrance is, yes, it is a spicy amber, but it does more. And the reason that this kind of takes it to the next level is that ambergris accord is front and center here because it's the air over the Moroccan desert. And the way that he creates that shimmery, you know, imagine being over the Moroccan desert. Imagine being over like a Moroccan spice bazaar where they're, the, it, people are buzzing down below, they're buying spices, they're negotiating with each other, they're arguing, of course, and you know how, and I'm, I'm half Arabic, so I can say this, you know how Arabs, you know, they argue with their hands, and they're, they're very animated people, right? So just imagine this energy down below, and just imagine it all wafting up into the heavens, and right there is where you, you get that uh, shimmery air. Thomas from the early Greek channel gave one of the best reviews of this on YouTube. Go check it out. Thomas from Early Greek, he said that the ambergris in this accord acts like um, acts like it freezes the fragrance in, for, in place, okay? So it, it's like Mr. Freeze. It freezes the fragrance in place. And while you're flying over, all of a sudden it's frozen. And you can look down, everyone's still frozen, and you can see everything that's going on. You know, it just is a beautiful piece of work. Yes, there's a little bit of cumin in the top. Yes. Yes, it is a spicy amber, uh, which is a fragrance category that's been done to death. But uh, this does something a little different, a little extra, you know? And so that's what all the fuss is about this. It really is a beautiful fragrance. And I think um, that this fragrance I prefer to wear in heat, believe it or not. I know a lot of spicy ambers people prefer to wear in the cold, but I found that this fragrance comes alive in the heat. Morocco, right? Uh, the air over the Moroccan desert. The heat really wakes this fragrance up. Wear it in the heat, you'll get different nuances than in the cold. And finally, my number one fragrance. If you know me, it's no surprise because not only is this fragrance focus on leather, which is my favorite note, but this fragrance is one of the best storytelling fragrances of all time. You know, this fragrance is transportive. There are some fragrances that you spray it on yourself and instantly it's like you're brought to another land. Like you didn't just open the book of the story, but you were put into the story uh, yourself. You were written into the story. Uh, and this is Lone Star Memories. 
And I really think Lone Star Memories is his masterpiece. I know everyone loves Led Do Desert Marquee, but I think Lone Star Memories is his masterpiece. And Lone Star Memories really makes me feel, um, God, I love it, you know. And what you get in the beginning is this big blast of birch tar, like this tarry, sticky. Imagine um, coffee or tea being cooked in a metal pot so long that it just turns to sludge, right? That's kind of what the what the leathery, smoky birch tar opens up like. But you get that tower stuff in here. You get that ambergris accord. You definitely get it. Even though ambergris is not listed as a note, I get it for sure. And it's mixed with sort of um, sweaty, leathery, clary sage. And the reason I say sweaty is because just imagine a cowboy sitting by a fire, um, puts the coffee or tea on, and takes his belt off, takes his six holster shooter off, um, and sets the worn leather belt that almost just has been molded to his body because he's worn it for so long off, takes it off, puts it aside, and you can just smell the, the worn full grain leather. Not, not the fake leather you, that you would go um, buy nowadays in many shops. And you can, of course, still get full grain leather, but it's out of style. People don't like full grain leather because full grain leather has imperfections in it. They like the perfect leather look. And that can only be done by, well, there's a couple different ways to do it, but a lot of times it's not full grain leather. Or there's a very expensive process that you have to go back and and do which i forget i've talked about it on the channel because there's a leather note that actually um is called that and uh what's it called it's called uh let's see if i can find it real quick saffiano saffiano leather is what it's called so um you know but just imagine this worn full grain leather belt right the cowboy takes it off puts it down He's so tired from working. He puts his boots up, which are also, of course, beautiful leather, but worn. Falls asleep because he's so tired from working all day. And when he wakes up, the coffee that he put on is, is burnt. It's burnt to shit. And that's where that sort of smoky side of it comes from. This sludge. Just imagine this sludge sitting in this old, worn down sort of um, pot, right? this metal pot that he's probably been using for generations and just burn the shit out of the coffee, wakes up, looks at it, thinks, eh, whatever, takes this uh, geranium scented soap, gives himself a bath. That is the story of uh, Lone Star Memories. And it's a beautiful story. The myrrh adds this resinous aspect. Um, the leather is unbelievable. And it's almost like you're seeing through the eyes of the cowboy. You know, there's a um, story that... Stephen King wrote, <coughs> excuse me, for the Dark Tower series where Roland wakes up and he's looking through the eyes of another man in, in an airplane. And Roland has never seen an airplane before. He's never been in an airplane. There are no airplanes in his world. So just imagine his surprise looking through the eyes of another man out the window of this iron horse, as he calls it. <clears throat> but this is like you're looking through the eyes of that cowboy I just described to you. Imagine the sky in the background. Imagine the mountains. Imagine the smell of dusk in the air. Imagine <clears throat> the um, tumbleweeds going by. Imagine sort of the isolated patches of grass because he's in Texas and it's hot as hell, right? Just imagine that. That's the image. That's the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. This cough drop worked for 49 minutes almost, but it's starting to go. Um, so I'm going to have to wrap this up, but... <coughs> That's the image. It's a beautiful painted image, a beautiful, um, just grand picture, a uh, gorgeous and Andy Towers perfumes. They, um, sort of, you know, are instantly, uh, transportive. They, they just take you to this place. And this is one of the most transported fragrances in my collection. I think it's a masterpiece even more so than later desert Marrakeen. So <clears throat> I'm gonna have to go get another cough drop, but I very much appreciate you watching. The um, family portrait of Andy Tower. Hope to add more fragrances to, to my collection one day soon. And I hope to review some of these that I have never smelled. Um, and so there should be more Andy Tower reviews coming soon. Let me know what your favorite towers are. Sorry for losing my voice at the end of the video. <coughs> I 
But thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for the support. You know, we're coming up on 800 videos, which is such an amazing, like, can't even think about that. 800 videos. Um, never thought I would get there that fast, especially not in just a couple years. So thank you to everyone who has supported me and watches and comments and all the stuff that you guys do. Um, I really, I really love the back and forth. So thank you everyone. Cheers guys. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.